Hi everyone, uh, I'm excited to welcome you today to the virtual symposium, Care Work, Space, Bodies, and the Politics of Care at Rice Architecture. My name is Brittany Utting and I'm Assistant Professor of Architecture here at Rice. And I, and I wanted to thank you all for joining us this morning. To begin with a few thank yous, um, this symposium is made possible through the generous support of the Rice University Humanities Research Center. I would also like to thank Interim Dean John Kasbarian and the Rice School of Architecture for their support. I would also like to thank my amazing research assistant, Kayla Vienne, for her incredible help with the symposium over the past semester. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, I'd like to give a huge thank you to Christine, Shauna, and Noelle of the Rice Architecture Events and Communications team. Uh, this symposium would not have been possible without their incredibly generous support, expertise, and above all, care. So as both an inevitable starting point and a looming backdrop, COVID-19 has forcefully demonstrated the physicality of our collective body. Health is communal, bodies are political, and care work is essential. Our current moment represents not only a crisis in health, but reflects more broadly a profound dismantling of the structures of support essential to the maintenance and reproduction of life. Our political and economic systems actively conceal and devalue the labor of care, isolating it within the private sphere and denying its capacity capacity to produce new forms of collective life and work. Today, however, care has reemerged as a space in which gender, race, and class are intimately reshaping the relationships between our bodies and their environments. This recentering of care as the most essential workforce, from health work to ecological maintenance to domestic labor, demands a critical reassessment of how we shoulder the burdens of production and reproduction together. Through an interrogation of two scales of care, the infrastructural and the embodied, the symposium will examine architecture's capacity to support these often invisible, uncompensated and precarious forms of labor. So while architectures of health quickly conjure images of therapeutic sanatoria, hospital campuses or temporary quarantine housing, architectures of care are more deeply inscribed in, in the everyday habits, banal spaces and background surfaces of our lives. They constitute our social infrastructures of kinship and even survival. So this symposium will embark on an examination of how concepts of care across multiple disciplines have redefined the boundaries between our bodies, our collective structures and our environments. Through these frames, the symposium will interrogate architecture's relationship to care as an intimate alliance between the built environment and its embedded material, social and labor practices. Using this moment to take stock of these critical infrastructures, how can we unearth and cultivate new formats for care? So, before we get started, a quick note on the webinar format. For those of you watching the lecture, please feel free to ask a question by typing it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Student representative Caleb Yen will read them out loud after the lecture for all to hear and the panelists to answer. So the symposium is organized into two panels today with a closing keynote tomorrow evening. Today's morning panel, Infrastructures of Care, will examine architectures of care through frameworks of labor, ecology, and community. Joining us this morning for the Infrastructures of Care panel are Maria Escidici, Torsten Lang, Sarah Nichols, and Rosario Talevi. Um, and some of them are on the screen over here. So I'm gonna introduce uh, our first panelist, uh, Maria Escidici, uh, and then we'll get started. Maria Escidici is the editor of AA Files and the founder of Black Square, a collective engaged in research by design since 2014. Maria is the coordinator of the history and theory course at the School of Architecture of the Royal College of Art and a diploma unit master at the Architectural Association in London. She earned her PhD from Delft University in 2014. Her theoretical research focuses on the role of architecture in the construction of modern subjectivity. With Black Square, Maria pursues a trajectory which questions the link between form, image, and use. Most recently, Black Square's work has been exhibited at the Frac Orléans Versailles Landscape Biennial, Rabat Art Biennial, and the Seoul Biennial of Architecture and Urbanism. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to Maria. Thank you all again and welcome. Thank you so much. Actually, I'm going to share my um, presentation, but in the meantime, I wanted to thank the organizers, of course, uh, Brittany, but the whole team, you've been really amazing actually setting up this event. Um, and I should be up and running uh, now in a second. Okay, it's all good, right? You can see my screen, right? 
Um, I think you're in presenter mode right now. Um, well, it worked earlier though. Yeah. Um, so let me try something else. Uh, okay, slideshow, perfect. is this fine? Yeah, perfect. let me try yes. from here. Now? Oh, no, we're back in presenter mode. Um, hmm. Okay, I will have to go unplug it. I hope that actually this is not going to take too long because I mean, I don't, I don't want to actually, okay. you know, take more of your time. Um, so again, thank you so much actually for having me uh, today. Um, and uh, actually, I wanted to start with this quote because I've always been really fascinated, almost obsessed, I would say, uh, by this infamous incipit of uh, Leo Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. Because as a designer, I really think that it reflects uh, perfectly the attempt uh, of modern architecture to script an ideal dwelling uh, for an ideal family. And the archetype actually of this ideal dwelling uh, is Henry Roberts' uh, 1851 Model Houses for Families, which traces really this perfect portrait of the happy working class family. It has a living room, it has a scullery, a bedroom for the female children, a bedroom for the male children, of course, separated by gender, and of course, a bedroom for the parents. Um, or each of them pigeonholed in their specific space, right? And so this is actually still the standard package we deliver today as commercial designers. And I have been a commercial designer actually for quite a few years uh, before going back, in fact, to academia. And of course, uh, this is really nothing else but a, a machine for the creation of precise roles for the roles of the people within the family. Um, and material feminism has taught us uh, uh, more specifically, that this type of house is an apparatus that naturalizes care, that turns the reproductive labor uh, of women specifically, but of course, often also of men, into something natural, unseen, unwaged, uh, often unappreciated. Uh, uh, and from childbearing to child rearing to cleaning, cooking, uh, taking care of the emotional needs of all the members of the family, all this labor, of course, uh, goes, uh, uh, in fact, uh, unwaged uh, and hidden, essentially, uh, by the existence of this mechanism uh, that is in fact actually the, the house for the perfect family, if you want. So my designer's curiosity was piqued. What if I looked at unhappy families for once, not at happy families, not at the, at the standard a happy family? What's there to learn perhaps as designers from unhappy families? And that's why I, I started to investigate a few years ago uh, the idea of single living uh, um, as the opposite of the happy family. And one of the contemporary case studies that stood out uh, to me is the Korean Goshi Won. Um, it's a kind of accommodation that originally catered to students, the students who needed a secluded place to cram for exams. And every room originally contained just a table. So you would rent it by the hour or by the afternoon. Uh, and then of course, you know, from there, uh, the situation started to evolve because uh, some landlords started to put in a bed and then eventually a shower and so on and so forth. And so by the 1990s, it had become a, a low cost boarding house for young singles who ended up first sleeping and then showering and eventually living there really full time. And in conditions that are often quite extreme, in fact. Um, but the interesting thing about the Goshi One is that all the reproductive labor here in this kind of accommodation of housing needs to be paid and bought from food to dry cleaning and even sexual intimacy, in fact. With my practice Black Square, we have experimented on a model that abstracts the potential of such a model and tries to recast it in a way that allows for solidarity beyond singlehood, because that's the problem of the Goshi one, right? It, it doesn't let you break through this kind of cocoon of, of singlehood. And if contemporary Goshi ones, in fact, are often places of desperation, this case study of unhappy family pushed me to think about ways in which maybe different ways of conceiving care different from a traditional way in which we conceive care within the happy family, perhaps could potentially trigger a typological experiment. So what I want to show you today is really something about actually typology, a typological experiment in which reproductive labor might not be confined to the traditional spaces of the happy family, but becomes actually a socialized form of engagement perhaps, and might allow individuals in fact to relate to each other and take care of each other beyond the framework of the nuclear family. But what I want to show you today, in fact, is not my own work, uh, the work that I do with Black Square, although this was kind of, you know, the introduction uh, to uh, my brief talk of today, but actually the research that I have been developing at the Architectural Association, where I run a diploma studio with my partner, Pier Vittorio uh, Aureli, 
um, we did actually this design unit that is called Diploma Unit 14. And so I will try to use some projects that emerged actually uh, within the research of Diploma Unit 14 to illustrate a position on dwelling and care and perhaps also put forward some attempts to break through the mold of the happy family or of what we are forced to consider a model of the good life, to look for more of a range of diverse versions of what it might mean to design, design spaces for happiness outside of this mold and spaces of care, of course. And so my first thesis um, on dwelling is actually this very trite like motif that an ideal woman, and of course the ideal woman is, is kind of the first character that is pigeonholed by the modern apartment, is a maid in the parlor, a cook in the kitchen, and a whore in the bedroom. And of course this implies that there is such a thing as a bathroom, a kitchen, a living room, a parlor in each of our own houses, right? Which is, to be honest, really not a given typologically because these are all spaces that emerged only in modernity, in fact, and in Western modernity uh, at that. And the special experiment really that I would like to put forward here is about the way in which care ultimately scripts space. And this project for an urban villa in Tokyo, uh, Eugenie Blia, designed four single family units, one per corner, which follow the convention of standard housing, except for one detail. They all share the same kitchen, that space in the center. So the space in the center of the building, this kind of cross shape becomes a place of shared care where parents from the fourth family can help each other in daily tasks, children can play and can study. And of course, every family still has a private living room. So this extra space utilizes the center of the deep floor plate of the house, offering lights and views on all sides. And each family can enter their unit from a different side of the urban block, so offering them an individual special entrance, uh, something that belongs just to them. And of course, there are possibilities for personalizing the family space while still sharing domestic tasks and, and supporting each other. So there's a kind of typological shift where just by, in a way, fusing the four kitchens into one, all of a sudden a different way of conceiving domestic labor uh, can emerge potentially. This other project, on the other hand, actually in London, Louise Underhill was really trying to rescript the London Terrace House um, by imagining not as a sequence of families enclosed by party walls. If you're familiar with London Terrace Houses, much as any other type of terrace house, they are basically slices subdivided by very impermeable uh, party walls. Uh, but rather actually in this case, uh, it becomes a fluid space where each unit can choose uh, whether to share something with their neighbors, uh, a play space, a living room, an office, for instance, or a kitchen, or maybe not. And actually the building is organized in modules, um, these kind of square modules that are in fact uh, cubic modules, if you see them in section. And they, uh, these cubes basically measure seven foot by seven foot by seven foot. So they can potentially be further subdivided with partitions or light mezzanines. But the whole point is to let actually the user the choice basically the way in which actually they want to, uh, to partition in fact actually this space. And of course the way in which actually daily care of each other can be socialized and with whom and when. My second thesis actually on the current predicament of dwelling is that every revolution starts from a bed. That is to say that the design of our everyday spaces profoundly affects us, which of course is a platitude, uh, but you know, uh, is worth actually investigating further. And what I wanted to suggest here um, is that by changing the design of those elements, sometimes of very simple elements, just as a bed or a kitchen or the shape of a room, maybe we could liberate new forms of social imagination. And that therefore care can be reimagined and mobilized through architectural form, in fact. And this project for London, Antonis designed housing units which are organized around the general's living room. So this kind of an interrupted space is, uh, that you see let me see if I can use my pointer, in fact. Um, no, I cannot use a pointer apparently, but you see these wider spaces actually in uh, between. And the rest of the conventional rooms uh, that a happy family is supposed to have in this case are just alcoves. So basically pieces of furniture that can plug uh, on the main space. And these alcoves are engineered so that you can create different environmental conditions. So you can create solitude, seclusion, but also more or less light and silence, of course, and privacy. And of course, all of these niches can be removed and can be replugged again, offering the user agency in how they script their everyday life. And so basically with this project, what I think 
Antonis was really trying to do was to kill the very traditional idea of scripted rooms uh, Henry Roberts had put forward, right? Where there's a space for the children, a space for the parents, uh, a space for the male, a space for the female, and so on and so forth. And a similar pro problem of extreme scripting that happens in family apartments uh, all over the world, I would say, but maybe is nowhere more aggressive or clear than in South Korea in uh, this kind of archetypal type of apartment building that is called uh, apete, in fact, in South Korea. And the apete is almost like the opposite of the Goshi one. So the example that I was showing you earlier. In fact, uh, uh, to have an apete is supposed to be actually a necessary success of part of a person growing up, in fact. You are happy if you can get an apete, and you are unhappy if you can only afford a room in a Goshi one. And of course, you are alone without a family. And so actually here, what is interesting in this project is that the author, Zhang Won, tried to redesign a typical apete slab. So he takes the same exact envelope of an apete slab. But uh, uh, what he does is actually trying to organize all the services, electricity, plumbing, uh, and so on, in such a way that the floor plate is completely free. So there are no load bearing walls. All the structure is just these pillars essentially. And so you can choose where to put the partitions and plug what you need directly into the floor or into the columns. Again, having complete agency over your uh, everyday life, in fact. And this is really a project that is all about the way in which the very formal arrangement of that which we don't see in architecture, in fact, the services, um, actually really impacts profoundly our daily habits. So depending on you know, where we put a kitchen or a bathroom, our everyday life is almost automatically scripted. And what Zhang Wan was trying to do here was to, in fact, liberate the users actually from the script. And so it's up to the users here to rethink their daily habits, to decide whether they want a conventional apartment, like the first one that you see on the left, or a complete open space, like the one that you see more in the center, or anything in between for that matter. And so you can see here that it all boils down really to a highly calibrated design of the columns and of this very deep floor plate that hosts all that is needed for life to happen. So of course, pipes, sewage, and so on and so forth. And so by rethinking the way in which organize the house, the user is really invited to, or challenged actually rather, to rethink the way in which they organize care in their daily life. Of course, also rethinking uh, uh, gender hierarchies, uh, age hierarchies, and so on and so forth. And the third thesis is that uh, here I'm going to steal actually the words of designer and Archizum founder Andrea Branzi that today we live in our offices uh, and work from our homes. And as Brittany was, say Brittany was saying earlier, uh, we are seeing it all, you know, the more clearly right now, actually with the recent uh, coronavirus crisis that has impacted, I think, even more profoundly our daily lives actually. Um, but actually here, for me, what is interesting about this realization is that it becomes a turning point because it forces us to consider that care is not only something that happens within the house, but is in fact an aspect of life that happens everywhere at different scales in different ways. It's just that as designers, we are often very blind, in fact, in fact to this fact. So in this proposal for a densely populated neighborhood in Naples, Francesco sought to offer a space of social care that is deeply needed as life in the streets of this neighborhood is often uncomfortable, if not downright, downright violent, especially for young people. And he saw that the roofs of the buildings have a huge potential to offer space to shared activities without much inter architectural intervention. And that's not happening yet just because people protect their private property. So they are as yet unwilling to share. But if they would be willing to share, they could turn the roofs into spaces of leisure, mutual support, and education, and even work, in fact. And that without the need of much money or state intervention, just by repaving the roofs, building strategically some parapets and framing walls and repainting them, providing an environment that for me is really interesting because it mediates between the family and the city is neither of the two uh, scales somehow. And so it discovers a scale that is not domestic yet not public is common, you could say. And where care of the self uh, and care of also of one's neighbors uh, can translate into communal cooking, for instance, but also sunbathing, uh, play for children, and enjoying the views of the city at large, of course, helped by the fact that the weather it tends to be actually quite nice in Naples. And similarly, actually, in this project for Hangzhou, China, uh, Lei sought to put forward a new space for social aggregation, 
So it's a kind of agenda similar, if you want, actually, to the previous agenda in Naples. But this time, actually, they focused on one specific activity, the idea of cooking and eating uh, together. So he proposed a series of small enclosed gardens hosting cooking facilities that are open on booking for local residents. So groups of locals actually can enjoy this communal garden for a few hours of conviviality. And these gardens are inspired by the tradition of the scholar's garden, the Chinese scholar garden. And so they are enclosed, in fact, actually towards the city. And then, you know, they open up uh, towards the central space, usually focused on a local waterway. And of course, this offers the user's intimacy and again, a mid scale of care that goes beyond the family to encompass the group of friends or neighbors. And what I personally really liked of this project is that it's really a project that values, you know, friendship uh, as a fundamental value actually of human existence. It's something that we address, I think, hardly ever as, as designers. And Lay designed actually a range of architectural elements that populate these gardens that are between the scale of furniture and that of the building. So it's pavilions, enclosures, gazebos, communal tables, and a number of appliances actually for cooking uh, together. Um, that they are really the instruments really to recast the cooking and eating as a moment of conviviality, uh, care, but also cultural sharing. And my fourth thesis is that downstairs uh, really is the new upstairs, uh, and that care, therefore, is way more than a technical issue. And this, for me, is specifically important right now when it has become clear that there is a very profound link between social crisis and ecological crisis between social care and environmental care. And actually here in this project for Uttar, Uttar Pradesh in uh, Northern India, Chan sought to design a range of small scale uh, interventions again, low, low tech, they are collective equipment spaces for the farmers of the region. And they are to be deployed in strategic places, uh, of course, completely bottom up. So this is just a proposal that the locals could implement by themselves. Um, but they, it would help, in fact, to hold together the very fragmented agricultural pattern uh, of the region, allowing the local farmers to share storage, to share water access, to share educational facilities and other tools held in common, which is very important because it would improve, in fact, actually their daily life without impacting uh, ecologically too much uh, on, uh, on the landscape, in fact. So ultimately, the project is nothing more than a toolbox so a series of small adaptable interventions that can be deployed depending on how the users prefer, that don't require much material or even much manpower at all because they are all built in the locally produced brick. But the thing is that in virtue of their placement and of the fact that they share an architectural grammar, they manage to produce hopefully a sense of large scale solidarity of cohesion, again, that goes out, outside of the scale of the family at the scale of the community offering a visible embodiment of the care that the farmers have for the land, but also for their community, because some of these equipments are also social equipments, such as crashes, for instance, and so on and so forth. In a similar way, actually, in this proposal for Casamance, uh, so it's actually the southern part of uh, uh, Senegal, Alexandra wanted to off a range, offer a range of tools to cater specifically, in this case, to market spaces, so while you know, the project in Uttar Pradesh was more about agriculture, this is more about actually sharing and selling the product, uh, in fact. And in, this is a region in which informal markets are really the beating heart of the community. And interestingly, they are often also spaces of female solidarity, where this kind of informal exchange you know, fosters links that, again, go uh, beyond, uh, beyond the family, in fact. And so actually, in this case here, uh, the proposal is a simple platform that, that frames this space of exchange for uh, recurring markets. Um, and, uh, and actually, this can become a point of urban coagulation in, uh, in the tissue of mid-scale towns uh, in Casamance. And eventually, the community can decide to top the platform with a communal building that can function as a storage, therefore making exchange actually uh, easier and more fluid. And while the construction techniques are completely local and again, rather inexpensive or unpretentious, the placement and the scale actually of this very simple roof turns it into a tangible sign of community involvement. Even sheltering potentially a kitchen garden that can become an opportunity for further sharing and care at the scale of the town and perhaps eventually even the region if these markets are deployed in a network logic. <clears throat> 
And finally, my last point uh, here, I'm actually going to uh, quote the ending of Voltaire's Candide, that closes actually with an invitation to take care of one's garden. That is to say, to focus on concreteness rather than ideology. And of course, this can sound incredibly narrow-minded, right? It has, it has all the sound of like retreating, retreating into one's backyard. But I think we could also take this as a challenge. So to say, what if our garden is in fact actually the world? Uh, what if we actually take this as a challenge to act, act concretely on the world around us, seeing all of it as our own garden, which I think is needed in light of the ecological crisis that we're going through. And so I would say that this is really, for me, a challenge to rethink care beyond the scale of domesticity. And in this proposal for Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, Roberto sought to rethink the mountains that dot the city. There are today untouchable natural parks so that the citizens cannot access them virtually. And while of course natural parks are in principle a good thing, Roberto here was wondering whether there couldn't be ways in which local population could interact with them sustainably in a relationship of stewardship. So he ringed the mountains uh, with a path that you might be seeing, it is this kind of dashed line uh, at the center of the drawing. And he basically just provided, in fact, uh, access to this, to this path. And the path actually delimits the limit of the buildable area. And then the architecture is just a series uh, of these kind of linear access points uh, to the path. So ramps, small playgrounds, water points, uh, just to help the population access the path. And all of this will, will hopefully actually allow the locals to have educational activities, but also to forage fruits for eating and to take care of the plants that already exist in place, that very often in fact are, are fruit plants. So here you see how the proposal really seeks to invite the locals to take care of the mountain, to engage with it without consuming it in fact. The architecture is kept to a minimum. They are just blocks that can be removed and a dirt path, of course. So the path is, is exclusively dirt. It could you know, be washed away pretty much in any season. So it requires constant, uh, very, very small scale care. So that the relationship between citizen and nature, hopefully is recast as one of mutual care. And then finally, that's the last thing that I want to show you is a project actually by Caroline two years ago. Um, and what you see here is the courtyard of the Palais Royal in Paris. It's a very formal monumental space, mostly used by tourists before lockdown. It's an empty ground dotted with benches and topiary trees. So it's a kind of very, very rigid space. And inspired actually by the street demonstrations of the last couple of years, uh, Caroline imagined that what would it take to turn this terrain vague into a garden where the occupation, even the political occupation of such a key spot would be a statement, a political statement. We are not occupying for a morning, we're not demonstrating for a day, but we are actually staying here for days, for weeks, and we'll turn this space into a space of growth, space of culture, both in a botanical sense and social sense. So here, Caroline studied the techniques of guerrilla gardening, and she designed not a project because it's impossible to design this type of space as a project, you can only wish for that kind of social engagement to happen. But what she designed was a manual for occupiers. So she studied all the techniques actually that the occupiers would need to make in fact actually the courtyard bloom, to plant flowers uh, in an urban space, and also how to hijack electricity and water from the city to construct a space of shared dwelling and mutual care, even in the middle of a very formal representational space, such as the Palais Royale. So ultimately the goal here um, was to turn this garden into a signal of hope. And, and I think I want to close with this image because for me, this is actually a, a kind of, you know, um, if you want a, a final conclusion on the way in which actually we are trying through this kind of typological research uh, uh, to open up possibilities for different forms of mutual care, thinking that these different forms of, ch of care can change our cities, uh, but ultimately they can change us offering not only one special template for happiness, template of the happy family, but countless alternatives to rescript what we mean by stewardship, solidarity, and love. Thank you so much. Amazing. Um, thank you so much, Maria. Um, really beautiful presentation. Um, so moving to the, the second panelist, uh, Torsten Lang. Um, 
Welcome. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief introduction. Uh, Torsten Lang studied architecture and architectural history and theory, the Bauhaus University in Weimar, and the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL in London, where he also received his PhD in 2015. Currently, he's a visiting professor at the Technical University of Munich. His research focuses on economies and networks of architectural production in the late socialist world, and more recently, on gender, sexuality, and the body in relationship to architecture in the built environment. In 2019, he was a research fellow at the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal with the project Queer Ecologies of Care. He has published in journals and edited volumes and is the co-editor of Architecture's Reader, Critical Positions in Search of uh, Postmodernity, 1971 to 1976, Architectural Historiography and Fourth Wave Feminism, as well as Reframing Identities, Architectures Turned to History, 1970 to 1990. So um, I'd like to turn it over to you, Torsten. Thank you so much for coming and welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, also, thanks from me um, to you, Brittany, and to all the organizers at Rice Architecture for the invitation to participate um, in this really important symposium, uh, very timely. I'm yeah, absolutely honored and thrilled to participate. So in today's um, talk, um, I want to suggest that looking back to the ways queer communities have collectively responded to the trauma of illness and death during the HIV AIDS epidemic in the 1980s and 90s offers us ways to rethink the reigning carelessness and endemic global crisis of care of the present. And of course, the HIV AIDS epidemic is one that is far from over and also affects people who do not identify as queer, so that just as a disclaimer. So among others, I draw from Christopher Castilia and Christopher Reed's work, which addresses and indeed attempts to counter and undo the unremembering of queer pasts since the AIDS crisis. I also build on the work of the UK-based Care Collective. In their recently published Care Manifesto, they argue that an ethics of promiscuous care grounded in 1980s and 90s AIDS activist theory and indeed practice holds the potential to reorient our contemporary hierarchies of care in the direction of radical egalitarianism, redefining caring relations from the most intimate to the most distant while caring more and in ways that remain uh, experimental and extensive. I will introduce two examples of social infrastructures established in the late 1980s in response to the epidemic. Toronto's Casey House Hospice opened in 1988 as a support specialist treatment and palliative care facility and Housing Works in New York, a community-based supportive housing project for people living with HIV. Both these cases, I argue, can be understood as with what we might call queer ecologies of care, with reference not only to recent intersections between queer theory, ecofeminism, feminist materialism, and posthumanism, but also the work of such scholars as Shannon Matern, who in speaking of ecologies of care, urges us to think physical infrastructures and social ecologies in relation to one another, reframing care in terms of a complex ecology of human and non-human actors. Now, I briefly want to mention that this work originates from a 2019 research fellowship that allowed me to conduct vital primary research, archival, oral history, and other field work. Now, the ongoing um, coronavirus pandemic meant that much of the planned follow-on work, of course, had to take place from a distance. So I had to engage with the flourishing scholarship of co colleagues in North America and other places uh, from that sort of distant position. And I just want to mention here, among others, the work of the Marvelous Grounds Collective, for instance, in Toronto on queer urban justice, Olivier Valorant's rethinking of queer domesticity, um, Ivan El Munuera or Jackson Davido's work um, on the spatiality of HIV and AIDS. In particular, I want to acknowledge Gavin Browning's interactive documentary and mapping project on the history of housing works, which I have benefited enormously um, from in preparing this talk. Attending to these hitherto invisible histories in our field, I believe, presents a form of caretaking in itself and is deeply political. At the same time, thinking with these and other authors, I want to ask how attending to queer spatial practices, the production of social infrastructure, spaces for sociability, community organizing, activism and caretaking might contribute to rethinking care and care work uh, from a queer perspective how within those communities alternative forms of care have been theorized and practiced, which move beyond traditional gendered 
uh, concept of care, concepts of care that are based on narrow so biological kinship relations, foremost the nuclear family and its deployment within capitalist society and how these caring practices then took shape both within the built environment as well as active upon it. And we might think here of Michel Foucault's notion of friendship as a way of life in a non-heteronormative process of becoming, including importantly, the construction of collective forms of care and cooperation beyond the private sphere. And just to speak to these images, one of the earlier episodes that I'm uh, looking at in this project concerns the activities of a group of friends, lovers, and buddies around the Italian-born architect, artist, and activist Amerigo Maras, who died in 2000 from AIDS-related complications, and their efforts in setting up in the early 1970s an open space that rejected the dominant logics of artistic production and consumption. Again, what's important to me here are the ways these activities were entangled with other collective practices, such as the body politic um, collective that in its early years operated out of a small garden shed behind the com communally occupied house of Maras and his friends. And how within the pages of this initially mainly gay liberation newspaper, the heteronormative family as the principal reproductive unit in late capitalist society was attacked along with its corresponding speciality. So to sum up and to return to the 1980s and 90s for the remainder of this talk, my main interest really is in the ways that queer social infrastructures um, which we can apprehend with Gordon Brand to Ingram, Ingram as the totality of social spaces, organizations and services to fight trans and homophobia as they intersect with misogyny, racism and xenophobia, how these spaces are created and maintained. Or to put it differently, the social and material ecologies as well as collective forms of labor that sustain these infrastructures and their specific communities of users. The early years of the epidemic between the first so-called rare cancer reports in 1981 and the FDA's approval of AZT in um, 1987 in particular were characterized by a paradoxical mix of inertia and blind actionism with equally destructive consequences. At one end of the spectrum was wide, widespread lack of government action, particularly regarding the distribution of information, research, and the adoption of preventive measures, coupled with the ostracization, public demonization, and stigmatization of risk groups, especially after in 1983, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention had identified key risk groups later colloquially referred to as the four H's, yeah, homosexuals, hemophiliacs, heroin addicts, and Haitians. At the other end uh, was the increasingly heavy handed policing surveillance and clampdown on, on queer spaces. And under siege in particular were spaces that catered for anonymous casual sex, such as gay bathhouses that were labeled contagious, yeah, a threat to public health, disregarding their communal value and the bottom up sexual health work that was performed in these spaces. In addition to these aspects, the disastrous level of care of the increasing number of people with HIV AIDS in the medical system had grown into an endemic problem. In his 2017 book, After Silence, A History of AIDS Through Its Images, the artist, activist, and writer Avram Finkelstein recounts the traumatizing experience of his partner Don being admitted to hospital after he first began showing symptoms, um, signs of immunosuppression. Quote, Days went by before the orderlies could even enter the room, and, with, and it was only after I threatened them. This, they left uh, his food in the hall wearing masks and gloves while they did, and never returned for the trays. There was blood under the bed from the previous patient. We brought, we brought in supplies and cleaned the room ourselves." End quote. Even though specialist outpatient and inpatient wards were set up throughout the mid 1980s, for example, at San Francisco General Hospital in 1983, St. Vincent's Hospital in New York in 1984, or the Broderick Ward at London's Middlesex Hospital in 1987, the le level of medical and psychosocial care remained extremely poor in most places. And this meant that people with AIDS were frequently subjected to appalling treatment in an environment dominated by fear and paranoia, isolation, and without hope for effective management of their symptoms. Against this backdrop, Casey House opened its doors to, his first, to its first resident on the 9th of March in 1988. 
He was allegedly greeted with a hug after being transferred from hospital by fully masked, gowned and gloved ambulance attendants. The building, a semi-detached Victorian mansion constructed in 1900, provided a home for up to 13 people with AIDS, usually in the final stages of the illness. Its location near the Church Wellesley area, Toronto's so-called gay village, was determined above all by the need for closeness to the community the hospice served. And prevalence of HIV AIDS at that time was in metropoli major metropolitan centers, of course, with 96% of the infections among men, 83% of whom were either gay or bisexual. Proximity to other usually hospital-based treatment facilities, in this case, St. Michael's Hospital, founded by the Roman Catholic Sisters of St. Joseph in 1892, as well as easy access for community volunteers, life partners, and family members who were integral to the palliative care and support environment were other key factors. The idea for a free sending AIDS hospice in Toronto, the first of its kind in North America, dated back to 1985, when public awareness and debate grew as the symptoms had become the leading cause of death for men between 35 and 44. The project was initiated by the AIDS Committee of Toronto, or short ACT, established in 1983. Its goal was to address the lack of um, information by providing community education around AIDS with the help of government grants. Following a series of unsuccessful attempts by ACT and its partner organization, Arts for AIDS, to raise funds for the hospice project, a steering committee led by the journalist and social activist, June Calwood was established. And she had pri prior experience in setting up shelters for unhoused youth um, and for women's and women's refuges and approached ACT in September 1985. So shortly after Casey House was registered as a charity in fall 1986, the Ontario Ministry of Health granted a large chunk of the funds for the building purchase on condition that Casey House secured the remaining third of the uh, price through community fundraisers, including the drag show DQ, as well as several private donations. Yet this fundraising success was also viewed critically. For instance, the famous local AIDS activist Michael Lynch, founding member of AIDS Action Now, a group that demanded decisive action on treatment options, remarked that Toronto's philanthropic community seemed more willing to fund the death of people with AIDS than their living. Refurbishment work began in 1987 and was overseen by designer, historian, and writer Margaret McBurney, a friend of Calwood's, who coordinated six volunteer design teams and specialist contractors as the hospice's renovation project manager. Despite flying blind, as she later noted, given that guidelines for such a facility didn't exist, so requirements were often guessed, the hospice's mission to provide a specialist care option in a home-like environment guided the project's implementation. The building had to be efficient to operate while remaining as non-institutional as possible, she said. Interior alterations included the widening of doors for stretcher and wheelchair access in 1991, also a larger elevator and access ramp were added. There were major updates to plumbing and electrical infrastructures, including staff and patient communication systems, as well as new utility and laundry rooms and the creation of on-site storage. Rooms were fitted with electrically adjustable beds with a matching adjustable chair where partners, um, for instance, could spend the night, an individual TV set. Ceiling lights were dimmable to adjust to residents' photosensitive eyes and among the state-of-the-art medical equipment were also two therapeutic baths. The exterior facade of the building was stripped of its paintwork to restore the exposed warm brick underneath. Now it's worth mentioning that not only uh, the interior designer, Elena Brudon, uh, waived much of her design fee, but also other con consultants, contractors, and suppliers donated labor and materials either entirely or in part. And according to internal rep reporting, this pro bono work and donations uh, basically amounted um, to the value of about 2 million Canadian dollars. Yet Casey House's limited capacity, owing both to its spatial um, and logistical uh, constraints, meant that its model of support, specialist treatment, and palliative care was not generally available. While in its open opening year, roughly half of all referrals could be admitted, this rate dropped to a third in the following two years as cases continued to rise. 
To expand its services, a home hospice program was then rolled out in 1993. From 1988 to 1991, between 78 and 93 residents um, annually yeah, and their partners and family were cared for by the hospice's specialist nursing staff and volunteers, with the average stay lasting six to seven weeks and only two out of 10 residents discharged before effective treatment became available in the second half of the 1990s. So since 1988, then residents who passed away in the care of Casey House are remembered uh, with an annual quilt, and you can see the first one here in the image. Apart from access to ad ad adequate medical care, access to safe and stable housing was and remains a key issue for people with li living with HIV. Following Casey, Casey House's philanthropic model, Toronto in fact had its own supportive housing program for people living with HIV and AIDS called Five House, founded in 1988 by the lawyer Mary Ann Shaw. But I want to turn to the creation of Housing Works in New York. Um, uh, as I mentioned, yeah, it was um, documented e extensively by Gavin Browning through this website project called Housing Works History, as this um, uh, case allows me to draw out some of the organization's specificities. Above all, its minority controlled, community-based and not-for-profit character, which set it apart, I think, from other contemporaneous efforts. This matters not only because the experiences of marginalized groups have often been left out of historic accounts of HIV AIDS written from the perspective of white cisgender gay men, but also because queer, trans and intersex black, indigenous and people of color, along with those struggling with poverty, mental health, addiction or other social issues have historically encountered greater barriers to accessing medical support and housing. So founded in 1990 by four members of ACT UP's um, housing committee, Keith D. Seiler, Charles King, Eric Sawyer, and Virginia Schubert, Housing Works sought to address the overlapping public health and homelessness crises caused by benefit cuts, the, the deinstitutionalization of mental health care, and the closure of short-term affordable housing options. In contrast to traditional shelters, which often turned away substance users in urgent need of housing, um, housing Works applied both housing first and harm reduction strategies, which prioritized shelter as a crucial step before accessing other support services while offering needle exchanges, for instance, to reduce health risks. In its first two projects, the Scattered Side Housing and Independent Living programs that were set up in 1991, um, they catered to, do, to two different groups using different lease structures. Those who fit the 1987 CDC clinical definition of AIDS as the presence of both HIV infection and diseases such as Kaposi's sarcoma, and those who didn't, and thus had to rely on the shelter system. Between 1995 and 1997, Housing Works' first permanent project was realized with the East 9th Street facility, now called Keith D. Seiler House Health Center, um, which was designed by Alan Ransenberg with, and which combined individual housing units as well as various social and medical care infrastructures and business enterprises. It was followed the year after by the opening of the East New York Community Health Center in Brooklyn, designed by the Pratt Planning and Architectural Collaborative. These housing and community health infrastructures were embedded in a wider local ecology comprising training programs, links to private businesses and medical institutions such as St. Vincent's Hospital. Still, many of these projects also faced community opposition and nimbyism yeah, due to widespread fear and stigma of people living with AIDS. In this slide, Housing Works is Chelsea Thrift Shop, which opened in 1992, as well as its bookstore and supportive services in Soho, opened since 1996, not only serve to, serve to generate income, but also acted as interfaces to the public. Housing Works now operates 12 residences and supporting supportive housing projects, three healthcare centers, and 10 social enterprises across New York. Now, from the outset, Housing Works' ecology of care was more extensive than that of Casey House Hospice, whose reach, however, steadily expanded since the late 1990s, especially after becoming a small hospital under the Ontario Hospital Act and moving into a new building designed by Hariri Pontarini Architects in 2017, from which it now runs a day health program for about 200 registered clients. <clears throat> 
While we lack detailed data concerning Casey House's early residence income status, class, race, or ethnicity, presumably the largest proportion were white middle-class gay men. Only in 2001 did the hospice begin to reach out to street-involved people. Queer envi environmental planners like Brochu Ingram have thus critically noted that inequitable access, particularly of people, for people of color, persisted through the health crises of the 1980s and 1990s due to these groups um, effective exclusion from and lack of control over social infrastructures from the days of their establishment. So as a minority run organization, Housing Works again stands out in this regard. So what about the alternative forms of caretaking that moved beyond traditional and gendered concepts of care? Yeah? To what extent were they practiced here in these cases? Figures from the 1991 Casey House Annual Report show that between 70 and 90% of its professional care staff were female, depending on whether they were full-time or part-time employed. And we can only speculate whether the reason for this enduring feminization of care work lay in the hospice's association with St. Michael's Hospital, <clears throat> Hospital and its more traditional outlook on nursing, beyond the abandonment um, of traditional uniforms in favor of casual sweaters, jeans, and trainers, which may point to a questioning of conventional role and hierarchies between caregivers and care receivers. And you can see that outfit here in the image. And we have no information about the gender of the 126 volunteers who worked at Casey House that year, nor can we make definite, definite, definitive statements as to the gendering of housing works as community-based care model. But what looking at Casey House Hospice and housing works as queer ecologies of care shows us I think is that applying care theory to architecture does involve a shift in perspective as the feminist care theorist John Tronto notes, which considers, not, um, considers um, architecture not as a complete thing, um, but, all are, but all who are engaged through this thing, yeah? meaning that we need to think of buildings and spaces in relationships that exist through time as well as in space. In this case, these relationships were formed by a virus and by the creative and life-affirming responses to the health crisis that surrounded it. By the forms of solidarity, alliance, and care developed among queer people and their allies. Yet we must be careful not to romanticize these responses in retrospect, as Douglas Crimp has already warned us in relation to efforts like Art Against AIDS in 1987, and instead recognize that they were rooted in the failure of governments and a medical establishment to respond adequately and above all quickly to the HIV AIDS epidemic. Thanks. Um, thank you so much, Torsten. Um, really in incredible presentation. Um, I re really appreciate it. Um, I feel like we're moving very fast, but um, now it's time for the third presentation. Um, my dear colleague, Sarah Nichols. So Sarah is an architectural designer and writer who is an assistant professor of architecture at Rice University. Her scholarly work focuses on building materials, particularly concrete, and uncovers how materials are designed and the relationship between conceptions of materials and their use in architecture. She is currently working on a book manuscript based on her dissertation, Operation Beton, Constructing Concrete in, in Switzerland. Sarah is the editor of Rematerializing Construction, 22 Propositions, and together with Mark Angelil, Reform, Essays on the Political Economy of Urban Form. Sarah also works independently as an architectural designer on buildings and urban skill projects. Her recent work includes a weekend house in Germany's Black Forest, together with Nils Havelka, and a house for boat builders in Kerry Kerry, New Zealand. Sarah holds a Doctor of Sciences from Eteha Zurich, which was awarded, and, and she was the awarded the um, Eteha Medal for Outstanding Doctoral Thesis in 2020. Uh, welcome, Sarah, and thank you so much for sharing your work today. Thanks, Brittany, for the invitation and for, for bringing this amazing topic to Rice. It's really um, a privilege to be able to spend the day discussing this with all of our um, wonderful colleagues around the world. I've already really enjoyed the presentations this morning. So um, my talk is going to be a little bit of a pivot as uh, Brittany's introduction may be already hinted to in that what I'm going to talk about is rather than buildings as spaces of care to kind of ask the question of how do we approach the care of buildings and, and more specifically the care of the materials that compose our 
buildings. And so I've used this invitation to, um, to actually kind of flip a little bit of my work on its head. So I had um, to look at it from the perspective of care in a way, bringing the periphery of the story to the center. And in doing so, I'm kind of maybe more raising a question than actually answering it. So I'm looking forward to the panel discussion as well. But so basically to kind of lay this out, um, as part of my, my work on, the, on a history of concrete, I noticed basically that the notion of permanence was uh, remarkably present at the beginning of the 20th century. And this kind of, this attached to concrete and was argued for in different ways. And I, and, this is this maybe is not that surprising because of course architecture culture has a really long history of sort of privileging the idea of permanence but think a little bit about the context uh in this at this turn of the century moment you have you know you have um as danny abramson's work on obsolescence has identified you have the kind of rise of the idea of, you know, of obsolescent buildings of buildings that are being torn down a few years after they're completed as the real estate economy kind of uh, increases, you have the widespread devastation of World War I. And with, with all of these things kind of in mind, still um, concrete as a kind of new material was being argued to be permanent. And so the question that I look at in the research that I'm not presenting today is this question of why. But what I wanted to look at here is instead this, especially um, in the 1920s and 1930s, we see an emergence of a kind of related but extremely modern concept, that of immutability. So not the idea that a building would persist only to go into beautiful ruin, um, but rather that the, there was a possibility for a complete resistance to decay, that buildings could remain like their reproductions in photographs. And this inertness was claimed for a wide range of materials, aluminum, chrome, glass, concrete, steel. So I'm showing the Empire State Building on the left because this is the first uh, large scale use of aluminum as a facade material. And on the right hand side, uh, Ludwig Hilbersheimer and Julius Fischer's kind of landmark publication on concrete as designer that are sort of two sites that lay out this this uh, question of, um, of, a, of, of durability and immutability. And so this claim of immutability, uh, this, this paired with a claim that these materials, because they were inert, inert would be maintenance free as long as they were properly constructed, which is a really important asterisk that I'll get to later. Um, and that this antagonism toward maintenance went toward a larger technical shift from tacit knowledge to scientific knowledge whose guardians were antagonistic toward modes of knowledge dissemination that were not formalized, that did not rely on the academy. So as Austrian architect Anna Heringa has pointed out, maintenance is cycles of renewal, thinking in, term, in, in terms of her practice of thatching, rammed earth, stucco, and so on, become a form of knowledge transfer that allow the protection and maintenance of local non-enclosed tacit knowledge, which for the technicians claiming concrete or aluminum or steel was maintenance free, such seeming benefits were to be precluded, eliminated in favor of formal training, legal prescriptions and industrialized building. So with that kind of long prelude, what I would like to do today is to look at this inert view and also its opposite, a vitalist view in relation to care to argue that an understanding of inertness has pushed care of materials aside, while also wondering what would happen if a more dynamic view of the material as agent recentered it. Going and so I'll I'll go through actually the process liquid to solid to demo, demolition in terms of concrete as a as an example of this, considering care as maintenance cycles of renewal, and so on. So to, so to, to dive into the, with concrete as the example in this liquid state, and I hope this uh, GIF, which are clips from Jean-Luc Godard's first short film, Operation Beton, which documents the construction of a dam. I think here is, here is where concrete is, is not considered inert. And you see it in these moving images. It is wet, sloshing, pumped, vibrated, <laughs> 
hydrating, har hardening, and that this process is highly controlled through adjuvants like plasticizers, but also through a number of techniques. It is apt to go wrong in process. It is a labor uh, intensive process whose result is predicated on the, the, the knowledge and skill of the workers. And so here you have on the left-hand side an, an image that I'm very fond of, which is two workers standing on a construction site in the early 1930s wearing rain gear, um, rain jackets and, and hats to protect themselves from the incoming flow of concrete, ver which, which in a kind of sterile image is showing sort of the, the, the uncontrollability of the deluge to come and a modern day image showing that that, um, that for all of our I ideas of what modern construction is like, this is, this is a very, very much continues to be a kind of messy and difficult to control process. So as we know, wet concrete needs to fill in all of these nooks and crannies in the formwork without anyone on site being able to see whether it has actually done so. So gaps or warping in the formwork result in permanent bends in the surface. Each successive pour much, must match the previous run and be precisely calibrated and timed so that the individual pores are not visible in the hole. In short, as has been much observed, concrete is difficult to control. And so here, labor, care work of the material as it is understood here is articulated only in the negative, essentially as what goes on when insufficient care is taken. So what these images show are, are documentation of concrete that has been messed up from the pouring process going wrong, essentially. Um, and so when removed from the formwork, you see the vestiges of this fluid state remaining uh, either as intentional or unintentional um, marks. And so this, this result is not just a result, particularly when exposed, but in fact a highly curated process, which requires extremely detailed prescriptions for both labor and the materials involved in terms of the foam work. And, and what this means is that, uh, that on the one hand, when things go wrong, it's usually blamed on the workers, the lack of attention, lack of care, um, but also that this process is kind of far more fragile and communicated. And in fact, uh, for a very long time, no one believed that concrete should actually be exposed. Uh, it was considered to be vulnerable as a surface material and only potentially permanent when clad with, uh, with stucco or plaster or another material not left um, exposed. And it was only when architects began to favor leaving concrete exposed uh, in a kind of widespread mode in the 60s and 70s that the, that the industry actually pivoted to kind of solving this question of exposed concrete from the appropriate mix to the detailing to the expected weathering of a material that had been actually thought more as a substrate and that this process remains still today highly managed. Yet this process is when it goes, um, th this is also predicated on hidden forms of care that also happen after the fact. So I don't know if it's possible, look really closely at this image and what you can, what you think you see is a terrazzo floor. And Torsten actually, I think you were probably there during this visit as well. But what you actually see in this image is a place where the um, terrazzo actually failed. The aggregate sank to the bottom in one of the rooms of the Swiss National Museum. And in a panic shortly before the opening, they called in specialists who are known as concrete cosmeticians to actually paint fake rocks onto the surface of the floor to give the appearance that nothing had gone wrong in the process to allow the floor of this room to match the floors of the other room in the building. So there's a kind of, um, there's a concealment actually of the result of the process through this hidden industry of the concrete cosmetician. And, and here, another example of this uh, sort of before after from one of the industry websites showing the way that uh, the misfirings, let's say, in the, in the casting process can be kind of concealed or corrected. So this is a kind of form of repair that is perpetuating the myth of inertness 
the myth that that um, maintenance and attention is not needed, maybe in a way just like other cosmetics. Um, but once the building is completed, this vitalism of the liquid view is usually gone and we revert to an idea of a material which is inert, which is monolithic, which is permanent. And so showing kind of just two examples of this, one, an early bridge proposal from 1911, which is trying to show, trying to express the monolithicness in an extremely monumental way. And on the right-hand side, a more contemporary project by Miller and Moranto, which is also articulating kind of the the stoneness of the concrete as one way of, of making this durability argument. And so recent works within architecture on maintenance, and I'm thinking of Hilary Sample's maintenance architecture book, as well as Becca and Lamont's Kohlhaas House Life um, film and book, have kind of focused on maintenance through the overlooked labor of cleaning, vacuuming, wiping, mopping, spraying away the sediment that accumulates on a surface. Um, and in a couple of slides, I would like to extend these ideas, which I think are, are really important to bring back into the foreground to praxis, which I've already kind of shown as liquid, to repair, to mending, and to renewal. And so just to double down on this idea of, of the kind of inert or, or, and highly durable view of the material and kind of sliding this in, which is a collection of contemporary cement advertisements that are obviously emphasizing the strength and the durability of the resulting material of concrete um, in not so subtle and also extremely gendered ways. And these are actually from, from all over the world, from India, Brazil, and so on. And, and we could go even farther and say that concrete is not just considered inert, but dead and even antagonistic to life. So you have um, in the 1970s in the upper right hand, sorry, 1960s in the upper right hand corner, there were extreme concerns that reinforced concrete buildings were, were bad for people's health. And these came from different uh, kind of corners, questions of humidity, but a lot of them actually had to do with a fear that the, um, the reinforcement in the concrete would, would cause the effect of a kind of Faraday cage that was blocking the inhabitants from the earth's magnetic field. And that this was um, hazardous to the health in a number of ways. The, the news clipping shown here is claiming that reinforced concrete weakens the libido as a result of this disruption of the earth's natural patterns. Um, there's also, of course, um, the kind of deeply embedded cultural stories about concrete as a material of death, whether it's the mafia's concrete shoes, bodies that are hidden in bridges or dams, uh, which I'm representing here with a photo that Brittany actually took of the void, uh, the frog shaped void in a piece of sidewalk in Houston. And, and that these, this view, I think, if anything, is even more entrenched today, let's say. So anthropologist uh, Penelope Harvey Writing, uh, writing about the concretization of villages in Peru has talked about the concrete, for example, appears as inert matter, unable to summon life forces, that it has an incredible fixing power. But let's take a closer look at that purportedly inert solid. And so this, this is that closer view, um, the microscope view of concrete after it has hardened or hydrated. And um, so etymologically concrete and also beton, um, French or German, basically the same word. You have on the one hand, um, a root which comes from to grow together versus, and at the, at the same time from then for beton, uh, one possibly a apocryphal uh, root for this is that it shares the word with colostrum. So the milk which is produced uh, by a mammal with a newborn before the proper breast milk comes out a sticky and tenacious mass. And so there are these kind of hints of a life in this, in this um, substance, whether it's growing together or, or derived from 
milk. And I'm showing this, this um, image because what it is what is actually showing, which is difficult to see in this kind of uh, pixelated view, is that um, what happens when concrete hydrates is not only that the cement is kind of fixing together all of the aggregate and other substances in the material, but what it took a long time for material scientists to understand is that actually all of these things are kind of bleeding and growing together. So there's an enmeshing actually of the aggregate with the cement. One does not just remain bonded inside the other, but rather that they're, um, they're forming a new whole. And as uh, a discipline that would eventually be called material science was being formed and they were tasked with uh, studying a new material, which was concrete, which was difficult to understand. Um, one of the interesting things about the research reports is that an incredibly vitalist view ended up coming from these material scientists who came to the conclusion at points kind of again and again that the material itself was fundamentally unknowable. And so what you had was this very discipline newly formed to kind of dispel such hazy haziness was actually unable to get around it. And so, so to back up again about this question of, of through time, it, again, in hyperbolic cases, concrete was even argued to be potentially everlasting, yet crucially, this was not posed for an exposed surface, which was considered vulnerable. And so this exposed surface was described as an aesthetic of poverty. So here on the left-hand side, you have a socialist folks house in Bern, uh, in 19, completed in the 1910s, uh, which was out of quote, filth and iron. So concrete being the filth. Um, and that this was a sort of, this again was this um, promotion of the aesthetic of poverty, of leaving off the cost of a finished la layer, but also believed it was no longer needed. Yet, of course, this kind of highly curated process in order to achieve it. Yet, with this new material, there was no evidence to the contrary of these kind of claims of permanence. And when evidence of this deterioration at the center of the material appeared, it was taken as a shock. Yet, again and again, and this is what you see on the left-hand side is one of these shocks, uh, the, the very forensic view of a piece of concrete which has failed. Um, and that the, yet again and again, these similar claims of permanence were made by repeating generations of engineers and material scientists, that such errors had been resolved, that new improved concrete, their generation of concrete would endure. And yet it kept not enduring. Um, it was more fragile than has been understood. And so, so to introduce, um, uh, a paper which has been sort of much cited, Stephen Jackson's 2014 piece about repair, where he introduces the notion of broken world thinking and talks about fragility and our kind of maybe difficulty in kind of coping with fr fragility. He describes a world in which our infrastructure, especially maybe in Houston, at, at this exact moment, this is very easy to understand, is increasingly cracking breaking down and that we should take this as a mode of approach, a world in constant process of fixing and reinvention, reconfiguring and reassembling into new combinations and new possibilities. He lists ship breaking, cell phone repair shops, Wikipedia editors, all as sites that are kind of foregrounding maintenance and repair as an aspect of technological work that invites not only new functional, but also moral relations to the world of technology, redirecting essentially um, in the broader argument from moments of production to moments of sustainability and the myriad forms of activity by which the shape, standing and meaning of objects in this world is produced and sustained. And so the transformation of concrete does not stop when it's taken out of the formwork. Um, on the one hand, concrete is reacting with environmental agents. It's cracking and crumbling. This is what you see here, the documentation of a survey of the bridge condition after uh, carbonization and all of these processes are kind of undergoing. Yet at the same time, concrete continues to harden for decades. It gains strength long after construction has completed. So often you can add a, st a story to, uh, to a building several decades later, even when that load has not been 
initially calculated because of this added strength. Car concrete is thus both hardening and decaying at the same time while moving in opposite directions, stronger and more vulnerable. And again, from this kind of view of the material, the engineers that are supposed to be sort of dispelling this kind of vitalism and yet end up supporting it. What you have is again, a sort of um, not so visible industry of, of measuring and monitoring that understands these structures as sort of quivering whether it's the test structure that has these probes embedded in it, as you see on the left, to understand um, the deformation, or on the right-hand side, again, a plan that is sort of redrawing this non-geometric form in order to understand, again, how, it, how, that, how that shell is in constant movement. This happens as well at, at larger scales with dams and bridges. And here, the failure to understand how necessary this is also comes into play. So um, after the Genoa Bridge disaster, there was of course a lot of discussion about the way that this monitor, these monitoring processes had essentially failed, that, that monitoring was, was precluded because the design did not uh, allow inspection of the cables. So again, basically this vitalist view is kind of coming in part from science and I think it's 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 interesting to me that architectural culture has had has had more trouble kind of incorporating it. So to move then through again through these sites where we have um, pouring, the removal of the formwork, the repairs, uh, we eventually rely uh, arrive at a state of restoration. In this case, trying to reconstitute the original, also potentially as a site for care. I'm speeding up now because I think I'm I'm nearing the end of time. I've got two slides left. Um, and finally, then this question of unbuilding versus um, waste generation as a final act of care. So this is the last thing I'd like to put uh, on the table here. Jane Bennett in in Vibrant Matter talks about a view of matter as dead, which legitimizes consumption and destruction. And I think this is a really important uh, observation, observation that by rejecting maintenance, we have, a, we have essentially either disposability or a type of permanence, which is, which is basically mythic as our kind of two options in terms of understanding these building materials. And so what I wanted to kind of put on the table with this is actually what would it mean to take maintenance of vital materials seriously? What would this mean about thinking materials through time for not just cleaning them, but caring for them, for understanding them as interactive and vulnerable rather than inert, to denaturalize the idea of weathering? And I think as the talk has probably shown, it's actually easier to answer what goes wrong when things are inert versus what could be gained through a deeper idea of mutability. But um, this is this is sort of what I wanted to raise for the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for that amazing talk. Um, so we're going to go to the uh, fourth and final panelists before uh, we enter into the roundtable discussion and, and Q&A. Um, and so uh, Rosario Talevi, there you go. Um, so Rosario is a um, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Rosario is a Berlin-based architect, curator, editor, and educator interested in critical spatial practices, transformative pedagogies, and feminist futures. Her work advances architecture as a form of agency in its transformative sense and in its capacity of acting otherwise, and as a form of care, one that provides the political stakes for repair our broken world. She is co-director of the Floating University, University, research curator for Making Futures Bauhaus, the long-term collaborator at uh, Raumleber Berlin and a founding member of Soft Agency. She's a graduate of the School of Architecture, Design and Urbanism at the University of Buenos Aires. And she has held teaching and research positions at the University of the Arts and the Technical University in Berlin and the University of Buenos Aires. Um, she speaks about her practice in both institutional and non-institutional -institu contexts and her work and writing has been published and exhibited internationally. Thank you so much Rosario for joining us. Um, welcome and um, you can take it from here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Brittany, for the invitation. I would like to begin by sharing with all of you some questions around care and infrastructure. This is our panel uh, title is Infrastructures of Care. 
Uh, last year, as part of the Caring program, I was curating uh, together with Gili Karzewski and Saskia Weiler at the Haus der Kulturen der Welt in Berlin. We invited artists, writers, and academics to write letters to John Tronto. John Tronto is professor of political science and key proponent of care ethics. Uh, the invitation was to, to, to write these letters provided a loose framework inside of which uh, practitioners that were invited to, to be part of the program could position their own practice and identity in relation to Tronto uh, with the idea of informal correspondence. The letters span approaches that vary from genealogical to political to the planetary, so care in all of these different dimensions. Um, and I would also like to see these letters as an homage from our side to Jones. Uh, we also call it an emerging landscape of care. You can find all the letters at the website of the HKB and their new alphabet school. It's a really nice resource. Um, and going back to this picture, I love uh, with me and Gili speaking with Joan uh, and extending this invitation. You can see that Joan was very humble by it and she agreed to reply every, every letter. Um, and in our initial letter, we, we asked Joan, we share with Joan one of the concerns of this project, which was to think about care in an infrastructure, infrastructuralized. Uh, the point of, of departure of this four days program was to look at care through the prism of, of infrastructure. And we posed the following questions to Joan. If the conditions of social, racial, and gender injustices are products of systemic and infrastructural forms that constantly reproduce the same mechanisms of exclusion and marginalization, would inscribing care into the building stones of our social infrastructures generate a more just society? Um, and Joan replied to us this, among other things, but I would like to to concentrate on this, in, in this quote, where she says this using the metaphor of infrastructures makes the task of inserting care too much about stuff and not, a, not enough about relationship. I realize that institutions shape our lives, but is it enough to want to reform institutions? How can we make infrastructure relational? And what does infrastructural practice look like? Um, I would like to try to answer these questions that Joan posed back to us in her letter with another example of my practice. Uh, I would, namely the, the program I create together with Gili Kajewski uh, at the Floating University entitled Climate Care and the work we both do at large uh, within the floating, where we attempt to practice care and to try to think about infrastructure in a situational and relational way. Uh, when we think about urban infrastructures, we tend to think about essential facilities that make cities livable, such as roads, sewage, and power supplies. Uh, ever present yet overlooked, these are systems that typically become noticeable when they break down, power cuts, water shortage, roadblocks. Many of these infrastructural facilities were built decades ago as monofunctional entities serving one particular purpose, and as a result today, most of them exist isolated and enclosed uh, within the urban fabric. They are planned by the state, built and managed by expert technicians and are largely inaccessible to the public. But today, urban infrastructures have become complex and messy in nature. They can be seen as much more than old pipes, cables and containers. Urban infrastructures are deeply entangled with the landscape and the biodiversity of the environment in which they intervene. This is really complicated by the fact that urban infrastructures are traditionally seen as sites for experts. They appear difficult to read, hard to change and impossible to alter. But what happens when such space is opened up, its function hybridized and its use collectivized? What protocols, routines, schedules, and choices manifest when an urban infrastructure is infused with care, softened, and layered with diverse meanings? Can these new circumstances transform them into spaces for commoning and stages for public debate? 
A soft and a caring infrastructure collaborates with the existing environments and its agents. And such is the case, I would argue, of the floating university in Berlin. On the, on the site of the floating university, a diverse range of animals, plants, and algae have taken root and given birth to the unique landscape. A man-made environment reclaimed by nature, where polluted water coexists with the relatively new presence of the university, forming what Donna Haraway describes as a nature culture, or to use Gilles Clement's term, a third landscape. So you can see here on this, uh, on this slide, the site pointed with the, with the red pointer uh, was designed in the early 1930s as a rainwater retention basin to serve Tempelhof Airfield and its adjacent avenues. And it was encased in concrete after the Second World War uh, by the US Army. Today, it remains as a fully functioning public infrastructure as it holds and diverts rainwater into the city canalization system. It is also surrounded, as you can see, by uh, a green ring. These are um, community gardens and is therefore invisible to the passerby. After the Tempelhof Airport closed in 2008, the city redevelopment plan proposed to build over the airfield and to relocate the neighboring rainwater infrastructure. This would have transformed the city-owned piece of land occupied by the basin into a valuable profit, um, profitable asset for Berlin's real estate portfolio. However, um, I don't know if you know, and there was a Tempelhof referendum in 2014 where Berliners voted against the city plans. Um, and this not only prevented any kinds of construction in the field, but also the referendum protected um, the basin. Um, this this radiant rainwater collection basin has been closed off for over 80, 80 years, yes. And when the site was opened as a floating university in 2018 to establish a nature culture learning site, it was an explicit decision to reactivate the water infrastructure as a cultural and sociopolitical space. Um, it is in solidarity with the history of the site and uh, within the lineage of alternative narratives for urban development that we situate our mission. That is to open, soften, maintain and take care of this unique public infrastructure, its human culture and its multi-species overlayers while bringing non-disciplinary radical and collaborative uh, programs to the public. In other words, it's, it is a place to learn to engage, to embrace the complexity and navigate the entanglements of the world, to imagine and to create other forms of living. In 2019, Gilly and myself curated the climate care, care program on site. Um, climate care Climate Care explores the site's materiality and context, its political and social geography, and proposes to act out of those specific conditions. Uh, being on site in the floating university, as being in nature, with nature, with all our senses engaged and informed by that environment that we're inhabiting. To be on site at floating is to experience the connections with the surrounding environment, with greenery, rain, still water, algae, birds, unusual smells, and a wide open sky. And due to, th to this, we found that being present at the site raised the layered question of how we might care daily for our earth, ourselves, our community, and our education. What kind of infrastructure could we as curators create a floating in order to help practices of care at different scales? And how does those practices draw on and relate to the physical surrounding and the environment? There was another observation which was important for us, which is which we tried to, to take on with, with the program, which was fusing the current climate crisis with the discourse of care ethics. While the climate crisis was featured in almost every news outlet in 2019, you all might remember Greta Thunberg's famous phrase, I want you to be afraid. Uh, there was a notable absence of theories on environmental justice or of discussions connecting the climate crisis with other intersecting social, racial and political struggles. 
uh, the recognition of changing climate systems in mainstream discourse is not some grand discovery, but more a process of catching up with marginalized environmental movements which have long been advocating for change. So we felt strongly that focusing on constructing forms of making and sharing was crucial in order to address such an overwhelming topic. And that by diverting our attention to the bonds that we form with each other and with our environment, the current climate crisis could be infused with a sense of possibility. In this sense, uh, we center Maria Puig de la Vela Casa's notion of care, which provides us with an ethical and political framework for action. Her notion of care reframes the human as a caretaker a custodial figure in the ongoing recuperation of the planet and its people. She, she argues that to care is to recognize the fragility uh, of the bonds between both humans and non-humans, and that this practice of caring is asked ask us to cultivate a set of skills and sensibilities to maintain and sustain all kinds of life. Um, within this context, climate care was curated to develop tools to work beyond the crisis using pre-existence and ready available networks and systems, from compost making to experiment with biomaterials, constructing urban hives, weather writing or tuning in methods, reading aloud and looking at care on a planetary scale, the search for tools and methodologies was at the heart of climate care. Um, with Climate Care, we invited artists and designers to propose educational models that could encourage embodied and tacit knowledge to emerge from experiences on site. We call for the re-evaluation of aesthetic awareness and a revision of the ways in which we shape our lives through interaction, consumption, work and rest. We call for an education which prioritizes embodied forms of knowledge, production, and centers the politically charged experience of being in the world. Um, and this is a short introduction into the world of climate care and the floating university. And to, to finalize, I would also like to share with you a video we made together with Gilly that premiered last Friday at the Future Architecture Platforms, uh, which describes the current development on site and some of the ideas that will drive climate care next edition, which is happening hopefully if uh, Corona allows us to do it uh, in June this year between the 18th and 27th in Berlin. Um, the video is followed then, it's a very short video, it's just like two, two minutes and 30 seconds, and it's followed by a short introduction into the Climate Care Digital Archive, which you can also find online. And I'm happy to post all those links I mentioned on the chat. Um, and I'll leave you with the video. Yeah. Climate Care is a festival engaged with theory and practice at the intersection of climate challenges, ethics of care, and environmental humanities. Emerging from weathering the conditions of its site, a rainwater retention basin in Berlin. The program is a result of in-depth cohabitation with the constructed water infrastructure, its human culture, and its multi-species overlays. At Floating, we are working towards a site symbiotic organization. This idea also defines our public programs. Floating sits on a fully defined space, a rainwater retention basin, and a public infrastructure. While the basin still retains its original function to hold and divert overflow rainwater into the city's canal system, since opening this place for Berliners in 2018, our intention has been one of hybridizing its use and rewriting its meaning. We see the basin not as one, but as many diverse infrastructures, soft, social, eco-aware, and political. Since Climate Care's first edition, things have changed. On the planetary level, the coronavirus pandemic still means heavy restraints on activities and will reshape the formats we can host on site. It has also already reshaped all of our conversations on care and climate. But also, as we prepare for the 2021 edition of the festival, we have learned of the state-owned managing company plans to rewild the basin. 
Technically, this means the plants on site will be moved aside, the thick concrete floor will be removed, and the incoming polluted rainwater will go directly into the ground. Naturally, Climate Care's next edition will look critically at the notion of rewilding and question both the biological and ethical implications of this action on micro and macro scales. This non-natural natural site is diverse, complex, and evocative, and acting as custodians to it brings many questions the festival likes to address. Namely, how do we hold space for the complexity of our moment? How can we seek, create, and implement planetary alliances on this singular site? Wasser der Zytotikion Reticulatum bildet schlauchförmige Zellkolonie. We can drum up God all night. We can pray all night. But if we continue allowing and carrying of selfish and sacrificial ourselves, destroy our forest in this fashion, which better than another that provokes us to look at the sky. Yeah, and to close, I um, always like to pay my respects to the three women that uh, have been uh, in, in, in my practice um, very um, yeah, present, which is the work of uh, Erke Krasny and Angelika Fitz, which have brought this uh, care theory into, into architecture and into the built environment. And um, to close with a quote from, from John Tronto's essay on this uh, book that says that architecture as a form of care should be one that provides the political stakes to repair our broken world. Thank you Thank so you. much, Rosario. Um, I'd like to, um, could all the panelists maybe turn on their videos and we could um, start the roundtable um, discussion? Um, I'll give everyone a second. And um, to the audience out there, um, please feel free to ask questions um, in the Q and A. Uh, Kayla will be monitoring it um, as the as the discussion progresses. Um, so maybe just to get things started, um, I'd kind of, I'd like to maybe uh, pull out a, a few threads that I found kind of a really um, kind of incredible connection through the the four panelists, and that's kind of the the tension between. Um, failure and repair, right? The the tension between um, if it's Maria's that she sort of begin with the inadequacy of of the happy family. Um, Torsten talked about the the kind of the warning of of an inadequacy of a of a governmental or health infrastructure. Sarah began with the the kind of the myth of concrete as a as a kind of a permanent um, permanent and and um, un, unyielding kind of surface and. Rosario even ending with um, this idea of, of a broken planet, of a kind of a failed, um, a failed and fragile set of bonds. But the, the idea of care is always this sort of um, emergent, most redemptive narrative um, that once we see these institutions or infrastructures crumble, new uh, solid, solidarity networks, new infrastructures, um, new relations sort of emerge and, and take those places. Um, and and I'm struck, I was really struck by what Sarah said, um, it's there's a possibility despite the failure or with the failure we can think more positively through broken world thinking um cracking i'm just reading her quote cracking a, a cracking infrastructure is um in a constant process of remaking right and so there the, there's this sort of embedded um positivity that embedded kind of custodial optimism that is um, part of these uh, uh, recognitions of, of failure or critique and um, just sort of maybe as a provocation, I was wondering if um, anyone maybe would like to take up that thread or unpack it a little bit. Um, I just thought that was a kind of an interesting um, conversation that that united really the the four um, the four panels. <laughs> 
and in the meantime, anyone can sort of ask Q and A's. I mean, it's kind of tough because as designers, we are kind of condemned to optimism and, and failure is not an option, right? So even the fact that we are talking about that, I think it's a huge uh, step forward. And we have seen it, I think, in all the presentations of my colleagues. I think that Sarah was very, very clear uh, on that. Uh, and, and I think, you know, very often, even just starting actually the discussion, I think it's a huge step forward. Uh, the fact of admitting actually that failure is part of the process. Uh, I, I mean, it seems obvious, but it really isn't. Uh, and on the other hand, of course, there's the optimism that we, of course we are condemned to because making projects is all about actually projecting about the future, right? So I think it's uh, it's very difficult actually to imagine actually a projective uh, um, a projective discipline without that form of optimism. Um, but I guess that I mean for me, what days like today actually are, are useful for is exactly actually maybe not to change what we do, but to, ch the, the, to change the way actually the way we do things, you know? So even just, you know, talking about failure, admitting the possibility of failure, I think it's incredibly important. And it's something that it, it's not done enough and it's not done enough, especially in our schools, actually. Uh, it's also the way we grade uh, our students, which is already, I think for me, uh, uh, you know, criteria that is very, uh, you know, there's a jurassic criteria. We shouldn't be grading students. Uh, we should be working with them. Uh, but I think incorporating actually that way of thinking about things uh, from the ground up, even from the way we actually um, educate actually younger architects uh, is very important because many schools uh, still are focused on this idea of a goal-oriented profession and of not admitting actually that buildings fail, that, that humans fail all the time. Uh, and then of course, uh, sometimes, you know, these failures are in good faith and sometimes are not, and they put really our planet in, in a really dangerous situation. So. Um, I, I'm glad that I'm part of a panel where actually that discussion can even happen because there are many, many places in our profession where that is even, it's, it's a non-starter starter in a way. I, I don't know, I can try to sort of come at this um, sort of maybe also sort of questioning where perhaps, you know, certain infrastructures or certain sort of structures where perhaps um, also certain inequities are kind of seem to be hardwired into those infrastructures, you know, to what extent are they worth um, maintaining, to what extent are they kind of worth um, uh, preserving um, and repairing and so on, you know, so this might also be one question that we might want to discuss and I mean I guess at the end of my talk I did bring in this sort of word of caution um, that was also being raised by people like Douglas Crimp and so on, you know, to what extent I suppose, you know, all of these community activities then become um, co-opted or become sort of replacements for these sort of constant failures of the state or the state, you know, sort of ever more kind of retreating from its responsibilities or duties of care. So, you know, I mean, all of these kind of questions we might want to ask as well when it comes to questions of environmental redemption. You know, the other day I was re listening to a really fascinating talk um, by a scholar from the University of Pennsylvania, Davy Nittle, who discussed how from a queer perspective, we might want to critique um, environmental redemptive sort of strategies, again, because they seem to be targeting or they seem to be um, focusing mainly on, let's say, sort of certain neighborhoods, you know, built up by certain constituents and really kind of overlook, um, again, these sort of structural inequalities um, that are also kind of wired into um, the way in which sort of spaces are designed and, and, and distributed. Um, so. Okay, well, do you want to maybe start um, ask, we have quite a few questions in the Q&A. Do you want to start reading from those? Sure. Um, our first question, it seems like um, some of them aren't posting, so keep them coming. Um, but this one comes from Daniel Jacobs. Um, he says, thank you all so much for these wonderful talks. We have heard about renewed relationality, friendship, anti-inertness, and sociality imbued in the design of the built environment. Maria showed guerrilla manuals, dirt pathways, descripted rooms, and small shared agricultural structures. Rosario talked about opening and softening public infrastructures and natures at the floating university. Maybe these can be characterized as a move away from the large scale and top down or even towards non-scalable care infrastructures, reliant on hyper-local constituencies to implement and maintain. Can you reflect on the relationship between scalability and capacity of a constituency for this type of care? Um, 
I think what uh, what we try to do, especially with, with with the experience that we do at the floating university and through climate care, and also at the with the program that we did at House of Culture and the World, was to think on the different scales of care. No, like from the self uh, with our own body into into uh, intimate social relationships and then going into the community the city the territory and then the planet so to try to navigate that care as maria was saying in her presentation left the realm of the of the, of the private or of the intimacy of the house long time ago and it's a, it's it's a practice that it's uh, touching everywhere no and all these scales um i think thinking like re and this is i think one of the questions that we also asked with gilly on 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 the on site at the floating is like how can we relate that hyper local site this water infrastructure in the city of berlin with other uh, with other situations no throughout like not only to connect it to two different cities and to different infrastructures um, but to think that by um, yeah that by developing different experience there and to, to, to negotiate our experience in the world no in a way and uh, I think we do this in and we try to do to this to lose in, in, in multiple ways. And it's by bringing people to think together with us on site and to bring theory of, of care and, uh, and also to uh, practice it with our own bodies, like to do practices of compost. And uh, I don't know, one of the things we, we, we do is uh, we have these rubber boots um, and we go into the polluted water. And there you, um, yeah, you inhabit a site which is with all its complexities, right? So it's not about um, it's about being being present and develop a certain um, yeah empathy, I would say, with the concrete, with the reeds that are, wor are working there, with the algae, and uh, and I think you develop that empathy by by knowing and uh, by by getting to know or. Uh, by noticing, no? Um, and I'm not sure where, where, where. I don't know if I want to, to, to where I want to bring the, um, to, to, yeah, to bring my, I was just talking about the different scales and uh, the different interactions that we try to, to create and to be able to jump, I guess, and to transverse the different scales uh, through, through practices. And that you do through, through the different engagements. No? And uh, I think one of the things that, just to, to close it and to connect it to the ecological crisis is that um, this, we need to, this earthly condition that we need to acknowledge, we will do through our bodies in the first uh, place, to reconnect to our own bodies, to our own material, materialness in a way. And I think this is something very important that uh, we need to create spaces where we are allowed to, to, um, to meet and to, 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 yeah, to practice this together. Thank you for that, Rosario. Um, this question comes from Harish. Uh, he asks, how can we begin to reinvent architecture through these frameworks of care in our existing educational institutions? Is it more valuable to propose new forms of pedagogy and practice altogether or to work within existing modes of designing? I mean, I will, I would like to address this, um, this double track approach, no? Yes, we need to, to work within the existing educational institutions, of course, those are terrains that we should not abandon, absolutely. And on the other hand, we also need to create other spaces and then other spaces that allow us to be perhaps 
sweet and that I think this is what we what we like to do at floating is to create a space where we invite institutions and, and, and group of students and, and professors and, and teachers to uh, to experience or to be a little bit free of what could of their academic let's say um, context uh, and I think it's very important to keep the things in in dialogue and in permanent uh, yeah, contamination, I would say, no? Like it's, it's, it goes in both ways. And I think it's very important not to just create new forms of pedagogy and practice altogether, but to kind of infuse this, let's say, new imaginaries into, into the institution that sometimes they are coming from, from the outside. No? You know, I completely agree because there's no doubt that uh, uh, I guess that's, at least to see my generation, let's say generation of the 80s, but I would say even the generation of the 90s, uh, have been trained uh, still to think in a culture that, is, that has been written by white uh, male uh, heteronormative uh, subjects, uh, professors, writers, authors, and so on and so forth. And of course, I think that, I mean, the challenge that now these generations have is exactly to try to, uh, to look for other ways of doing things, right? Uh, but I completely agree with Rosario that, of course, uh, in order to know how to challenge the norm, you have to know that norm first. So in a way, there's a whole process of actually constructing new institutions and new methodologies and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, there's also a very tough path of actually getting to know and to understand actually the context uh, in a way the ocean in which we are swimming already right um, and and very often we see attempts uh, to to reform things without first criticizing actually the, the context in which we find ourselves so i think in a way um, i don't want to just i don't think actually um, I don't want to justify with this the fact that what I showed you are still, you know, plans, uh, you know, uh, uh, renderings and so on and so forth. These are very, very traditional ways of representing architecture. And uh, there are, of course, uh, many other ways in which actually we can, we could, we will actually represent, uh, show and discuss architecture. Uh, but these are these are pedagogical projects. So for the moment, uh, I try to actually parcel down or let's say, uh, in a way, cut the complexity of what we try to do uh, with the students uh, and, uh, and focus actually on getting as creative as possible with reimagining life, uh, leaving aside for a second the, the question of the medium. I also know some of my colleagues who do the opposite, who focus all of their creativities on the medium, and then they say, okay, this is our terrain of inquiry rather than necessarily actually design or typological experimentation. And I think that both, uh, uh, both strategies are good. Of course, within an institutional, uh, within an educational institution, you can only try out strategies because you cannot try to do everything at once, uh, right? Um, but, uh, uh, but I do think that it's, uh, I mean, it's a tough job because on the one hand, we have to learn that which we criticize, but then on the other hand, we do need to actually provide new platforms. And I think that, uh, you know, the examples that Rosario has shown us are really, you know, uh, wonderful because they go exactly uh, in that kind of direction. Um, and uh, I, I have no idea, for instance, what would a feminist architecture, you know, look like if there is such a thing, but I know what a feminist critique of architecture is or what a queer critique of architecture actually is. And I think it's actually maybe good that, that these uh, new forms of inquiry are not trying to define too much the future, but rather trying to actually cast a critical light uh, on the past precisely because they do, we don't want to hypostatize them, right? To crystallize them too soon uh, before they actually uh, really yield some kind of fruit. So I have my doubts about things like, for instance, grades, uh, pass or fail, uh, or even the role of the of the teacher in relationship to the role uh, of the student, uh, or the role of the professor in, uh, versus the role of the assistant. Um, I mean, I'm an anarchist myself, so I find my, I'm very very uncomfortable with all of that apparatus. But of course, the only way in which I can I can manage my own, uh, um, you know, not being at ease with that is to try to understand how it works. And you know, I've been in that for now about 15 years, and I don't have an answer yet. That then keep studying. <laughs> This question by Brenda um, touches upon this idea of roles. Uh, Brenda Reed asks, how, uh, can the panelists elaborate on the non-innocence and power dynamics of care work, the position of architects in a position of power in the community? How do you see working or balancing this power dynamic within architectural work? Um, 
I, I think we can all answer that in different ways and I'm probably more excited to hear what the other panelists would have to say, but I, I mean, what I would think about is kind of in terms of aside from, well, not aside from, but in addition to the power dynamics within, within the architect, the client, the industry, the um, users, which is already super problematic, I think, as a conceptualization of the subjects of a building, but um, that there's also kind of this, this um, well, continuing sort of the process-based approach that I tried to raise, there is, I think, a real problem in this idea of handoff and the idea that a building is something that is finished when it is just starting. And that this, is, this I think, is really core in this question of, uh, of this dynamic. I mean, who, looking, for example, at kind of the, you know, this, this difficult legacy of critiques, for example, of socialist housing developments that have failed purportedly because of a lack of um, maintenance, both in terms of the social and in terms of the physical fabric of the building, yet were projects that were kind of conceived only up until the point of, of opening without any kind of um, fostering structure in the way that I think um, the, the project that Torsten showed, for example, I think are a really beautiful alternative to this really kind of conceptualization of how the environment of the building is also inter providing care for, for its subjects that, yeah, that I guess I'm losing the trail a little bit, but basically that this handoff, I think is, is part of that problematic. I can add something uh, quite short that I think it's part of this, what we're going through is part of uh, this change, let's say, is a, a, a profound shift in understanding ourselves, right? As subjects, as architects, as space producers, as city makers. Um, and um, uh, I was watching Rosi Valgrotti explain post-humanism, and she has this beautiful uh, slide where the Vitruvius man in, in this yeah, frame, it's living the scene and living it empty. And um, I, th I think it's, it's about living the center. That's what, and creating the space for other things to also emerge and for others to take on that center, right? And I think this is something that it will be in architecture as we are trained, it's hard. <laughs> Um, but maybe it's, yeah, I think it, it's about, and it, when we connected as to how we learn and what kind of, uh, bibliography we read at school and so on, I think these are, are yeah, th these are fundamental spaces where, where this, this kind of bibliography needs to enter. And, uh, we're, I, I mean, we're still teaching the Corbusier, uh, which is not, necessarily bad to learn the, the work of modernism, but we're still learning it as, um, yeah, as this norm. This next question is for Torsten um, from Yagmore, uh, who asks, how would Torsten Lange, as a speaker of the panel called Infrastructures of Care, interpret the notion infrastructures, which undoubtedly differs from space, from a queer perspective? Which potentials do this notion imply? In this regard, would Lange re respond to Tronto's question in Tel Levy's presentation? What does infrastructural practice look like? I mean, um, really important uh, question, um, but one that is not like sort of super easy to answer in a couple of sentences. But I suppose, you know, what I was sort of trying to um, get to, or what I was sort of trying to argue is that, um, you know, to think of the infrastructure really as a sort of, I suppose as a sort of substructure that is absolutely vital for, you know, the reproduction um, of life in a way. Um, and, you know, for, in a way, being able um, to exist um, as a people, as an individual, but also as a kind of community, you know, on a kind of collective 
on a kind of collective level. Um, so in that sense, and spaces are part of that, but there are also other systems, you know, that we can think about um, that are part of this sort of infrastructural um, enabling um, uh, kind of, you know, substructure. Um, um, so what does infrastructural practice um, look like? Um, again, I mean, um, it, it's a very complex question, um, which I'm sort of, yeah, finding sort of tricky to answer, like, you know, kind of on the spot. I mean, again, I think, I suppose what I've sort of tried to show with the examples are in terms of these sort of infrastructural practices, you know, practices that are engaged in sort of building and maintaining some of these kind of substru substructures, you know, that um, that enable um, reproduction, both on a kind of individual and on a social level. Um, I can't really sort of put it in any other kind of ways right now. Um, I think we have time for one more question, Kayla. Okay. Um, a question from Michael, uh, perhaps more to everyone who presented today um, in a common thread that dealt with um, the middle or the mid or the in-between. Um, he asked, Maria mentioned a mid-scale of care and housing. In Torsten's presentation, this mid-scale is evident in Casey House, especially after its renovation. A mid-state is also evident in the vitalist liquid material discussed in Sarah's presentation. And the in-between is further suggested by Rosario's emphasis on the relational soft infrastructure and floating. Can you all discuss the in-between or the mid as a useful way to stretch or move beyond conventional notions of care? I can jump in, but it's not gonna be about scale. <laughs> but, but it'll be about this notion of in-betweenness, which I think is important to, um, to art articulate. And I, I mean, I think this is coming at a, at a clear uh, moment where along with all of our other kind of critiques of um, modernist discourse, we can add that, that there is a critique of the, of kind of the hubris of knowing and of easy categorization. And so I think this in between is, is, is important because it's, um, it's bringing in and of course, like we can put port, uh, point to a couple generations of feminist theory that also kind of got ahead of this, right? In terms of the cyborg and, and any other number of kind of approaches that that are about these hybrids, about this kind of fuzziness, uh, about that thing, things can be multiple things at once, that they can be in between. And, and uh, that, that for me is why I think it's important to kind of um, articulate not just the in between, but also kind of the agencies with, within that. I mean, what I think came out really strongly also oh. in Maria's talk was in a way the sort of historicity of um, these sort of separations, right? Um, the kind of lines between the productive and the reproductive sphere and the sort of artificiality of those kind of separations and how they're basically being imposed and um, yeah, reproduced um, by sort of spatial means, you know, um, how that sort of system of the separation between production and reproduction is kind of upheld um, by these kind of hard, um, build structures as well. And I mean, that is something that kind of interests me and that also, you know, basically runs a bit like a sort of um, red thread through a lot of the work that I'm kind of interested in is, you know, what are these kind of in, in between spaces or where can we find instances where these kind of spatial separations, but as well as these kind of separations between like production and reproduction in a way where they become, um, soft and where that kind of in-between space is being activated. But I think the other thing, apart from the sort of in-between, what I'm also interested in is the kind of distributed or the sort of tentacular, you know, where things kind of begin to seep out um, from a sort of central place. I mean, so with a lot of these kind of settings, these kind of medical infrastructures, you know, what I'm also interested in is how they become sort of deinstitutionalized, how they become sort of reinserted into the city and into the kind of communal um, spaces, you know, and sort of less uh, are these kind of uh, sort of less dense and strong kind of institutional um, monoliths. Um, so yeah, but again, maybe that is that speaks to this kind of 
hybridization, but in a sort of different, slightly different way where it sort of, yeah, like I say, sort of begins to seep out into other spaces and yeah, this sort of moment of contagion almost or something. Rosalie, and for me, you know, the in-between is also the space where things don't have a name yet or don't have a fixed name. So it, it's really the space in which actually we can rename things and invent new concepts or, or retask the concepts that we already have. So I don't, I think it's a question of scale in many cases, but it's also a question of uh, uh, in-between named things, uh, let's say in-between categories. And finally, I think it's also a question of time. And uh, um, and I, you know, I wanted to go back actually to the point that Sarah made earlier about the, you know, leaving uh, leaving a building the moment that the project uh, is done, not even the building itself, but just the project is done. I have to say that in the past few years, something that has been quite uh, important for me was uh, to imagine what if instead of conceiving ourselves as architects, we conceive ourselves as gardeners, because in a way the gardener never finishes his or her job or their job. I mean, you are you are there as long as the garden keeps evolving, and the moment that you that you leave, you are not a gardener anymore. You are not anymore neither the, the caretaker nor the steward nor the author of really anything. And I think that uh, uh, for me that is the in between. It's a question of scale, but it's also question of time, it's a question of categories. Uh, in a way, you know, we have to recast completely our role as architects uh, and uh, all of these things have to be at play uh, at once. You know, how do we intervene in the things that we do, when, and with which kind of mentality. So for me, the garden is really, I don't really like metaphors usually, but here it's really a metaphor of a different way of, of working with things rather than, than imposing uh, frameworks upon things. All right. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, we have gone over time. Uh, I apologize. Um, but I just like to um, thank the, the panelists and offer a virtual round of applause from um, all of the participants. Uh, uh, and so thank you everyone for, for sharing your work um, with us today. Um, so to our audience and also the panelists, um, please join us at one o'clock central time today um, for the second panel embodiments of care. So everyone have a nice lunch or dinner. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.